So tomorrow you have just the first four questions. And they're in this order. So that's all you have to study tonight are the first four questions. And then after that, you have questions five through um, ten on Thursday. And so no extra homework tomorrow night, just to study that. And then on Monday, you don't have school Friday, on Monday in class we'll go over the uh, 11 through 20. And then on Tuesday you'll take that second half of the test that day. So we're doing a half of a test over the next two days with the delayed start, right? So um, you will be permitted to use your, your a red calculator. I'll give you a red calculator tomorrow. Um, and it says give exact answers unless otherwise indicated. Okay, the only one that I'm going to accept decimals on is this one right here. Okay, so that it's not so atrocious with you guys finding common denominators. Okay, so just know that and I'll kind of go through that as we talk about it. Okay, so here we go. Um, show all necessary work. I said that, give exact answers unless otherwise indicated. Rewrite this integral as a limit, but do not evaluate it. So first thing, I should see your work on what your change of x is. Your change of x is top minus bottom over n, so 6 over n for this one here. And then I should see your work for figuring out what x sub i is. x sub i is um, the a value, which is 2, plus your change of x, and then i. If you use k instead, that's fine. Okay, Either k or i, either one, I don't care. Now from here, this integral and that dx are getting changed into the limit, and that's why it says write it as a limit. You better have that there, okay? As n approaches infinity of the sum of i or k equals 1 to n. And then we should have the square root, and then in place of each of these x's, we should put this x. So we have 2 plus 6 over n. Whoops, left my i out. 6 over n i squared minus 5 times 2 plus 6 over n i and then plus 2. I'm going to extend that out just a little bit more there. And then in place of this dx goes this change of x times 6 over n. Um, so if you want, you can put that in the front. This square root is holding it all together, so I don't have to have brackets. But if you feel better, just so that, you know, because sometimes you need them and sometimes you don't, there's ever a plus sign where it's like two separate terms. You have to have those brackets there. This is your final answer on that right there. Okay. You do not have to multiply that squared out right there. Okay. You can keep it just like that. questions on the first one. Okay. Question number two. Estimate the area from 2 to 7 under the graph of f of x equals x plus 1 over 2x using five approximating rectangles. And then there's three questions. Use right, use left, and use m. I should see two charts total. You can use the same chart for left and right, but you do need a different chart for the middle or the midpoints, okay? So first, our change in x is going to be our 7 minus 2 over 5, which is 1. So when I go to make my chart, my x values are supposed to start at 2, and they're supposed to go every one interval until you get to 7, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then our f of x will go here. All right, now from there, I'm going to add 1 to each of my x values, and then I'm going to divide by the 2 times the x value. So when I add 1, 2 plus 1 is 3 for that one. 3 plus 1 is 4. I'm just doing the numerators. 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then in the denominator, I'm multiply the x values by 2. So 2 times 2 is 4. 3 times 2 is 6. 4 times 2 is 8, 10, 12, 14. I don't know. I do that sometimes because it just is a lot less thought. Okay. Now from there, for right endpoints, 
That's an R5 that I'm looking for. I find the dif difference between my x's, which is 1, which we have that there. And then for right endpoints, I'm going to take all of these and add them together. Okay, I leave the left one off when I'm doing right endpoints. So I have 4 6 plus 5 eighths plus 6 tenths plus 7 twelfths plus 8 fourteenths. I should see the, that line of work right there. Okay, if you don't have that line of work, I'm going to mark a point off, even if you have the answer right. You have to shell your calculus work to get calculus points. Okay, now from there, I will allow you to put it in your calculator to get the answer. Okay, we're going to round three decimal places on this tomorrow. Okay, so when I do, let's see. And I mean, you can reduce those if you want, whatever. You don't have to. Three divided by four plus four divided by six plus five divided by eight plus six divided by ten plus seven divided by twelve. Oh, plus eight divided by. 14, oops, I got to subtract off that 3 divided by 4. I had added it on at the beginning accidentally. I just, I was looking down here instead of up there. Uh, syntax error. Of course there's a syntax error. Go back. Go back. Oh, 5 over 3 fourths. Delete that. Okay, 5 eighths, 6 tenths, 7 twelfths, 8 fourteenths. had an extra plus sign on there. Okay, now press enter. And it's 3.046. Now for left end points, that's L5. L5 means I use the 5 to the left. So this would be 1 times 3 fourths plus 4 sixths plus 5 eighths plus 6 tenths plus 7 twelfths. I put that in my calculator. And you get 3.225. Now for midpoints, okay? I'm gonna pull this down here so I can do the other chart down here. For the midpoints, I cannot use that blue chart right there. I have to make a new chart that has the numbers that are in between these. In between two and three is 2.5. Um, I like to use five halves instead, um, and you'll see why maybe in just a minute. And then in between, between three and four, is three and a half or 3.5 which is seven halves and then in between the next two nine halves 11 halves and 13 halves so when i go to plug it into that right there okay i have five halves plus one which is seven halves and then divided by two times five halves the two cancels giving me a five now from here, I have to multiply the top and bottom by that too, and I end up getting 7 tenths. For the next one, 7 halves minus 2 halves is 5 halves, and then 7 halves times 2 happens to be 7. Multiply top and bottom by 2, I get 5 fourteenths. And then the next one, 9 halves plus 2 halves is 11 halves. Wait, I think I did something wrong on that last one. I think I subtracted the two halves. It's seven, yeah, let's, let's go back to that one. It's seven halves plus two halves is nine halves. And then divided by seven would be nine fourteenths. Sorry about that, I just happened to see that. They should have been going up since the next one's going up again. Nine halves plus two halves is 11 halves. Divided by nine. Multiply top and bottom by 2, I get 11 eighteenths. 
11 halves plus 2 halves is 13 halves. Divided by 11, multiply top and bottom by 2, I get 13 over 22. Ooh, that's not a 13. And then 13 halves plus 2 halves is 15 halves. Divided by 13. Multiply top and bottom by 2, I get 15 over 26. So my MRAM 5 is the distance between the x's, which is still 1, and then 7 tenths plus 9 fourteenths plus 11 eighteenths plus 13 twenty seconds plus 15 twenty six. We use them all for MRAM. I put those in my handy dandy little calculator. And I end up getting 3.122. That was 1.8 right here that I rounded. So we'll do three decimal places. Your MRAM answer should come out to be between your other two answers. If you want to just kind of double check that to make sure it should. That way, if you did some kind of crazy little thing, you know, on one of them, it might show up right there. Okay. That question is like three and one. That's why I only have four questions for now. Okay. Next, find the indefinite integral, the integral of one plus cotangent squared x dx. You know the antiderivative of one, but not cotangent squared. So that means I'm going to have to replace it in some way. Okay, what do you think? One plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared x. Yes. So that Julie Hemingway sheet. And if you don't know how to come up with those, just use sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. Like that's what I do on that. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. And if I'm trying to get cotangent, divide this by sine squared x, everything. We get one plus cotangent squared x is the same thing as cosecant squared x. So if you don't have a memory, I know you know sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. But if you don't know the others, you can always come up with it. All right. And then what's the antiderivative for cosecant squared? Negative cotangent. Negative cotangent. You got it. And then, of course, since it's an indefinite integral, make sure you have that plus c, and that would be your final answer. Questions on that one? Number four is like super easy. It is on the test as well. Okay, um, this one here, I'm not. I'm not giving you any kind of crazy little things to try to, you know, manipulate around. It's asking you to write it as an integral. So here's our integral from three to twelve. Our function is just cosine of r minus sine of r, and then in place of the change of r, you put the d. Will the I ever be something other than one? Will the R? Not on the test tomorrow now. All right, next one. On this one, make sure you are showing what you're doing. Don't just give me numbers, okay? Show me the properties that you're using. So this right here says from four to eight is 15. And you can use a number line here and draw it out too. Here's four, here's eight. That part there is 15. From four to six is 32. How can you get from six to eight? Can't you take the big one minus the little one to get it? Then write that. I have to take the integral from four to eight of f of x dx and subtract off the integral from four to six of f of x dx in order to get the integral from 6 to 8 of f of x dx. From 4 to 8 is 15. From 4 to 6 is 32. So when you subtract those, you get negative 17. On these problems, it is common that I 
move something around. It's not going to be this straightforward tomorrow. Okay, like for example, maybe instead of giving you four to six, I gave you six to four. In which case you'd have to flip it and change it to negative. Or maybe instead of asking you from six to eight, I asked you from eight to six. Which again, you could find the six to eight and then flip it. Uh-huh. Now you have to show this. You have to show these this work right here. Okay. That's the calculus work that I'm talking about. You gotta show because those are properties. Okay. <clears throat> Next one. Evaluate this integral. This is just your good old antiderivatives. Okay. The antiderivative of two is two y. Antiderivative of five y is five y squared over two. And the antiderivative of y squared is y cubed over 3, evaluated from 0 to 5. Got to love it when there's a 0 at the bottom. That takes half of your work away. We have top minus bottom. The bottom is just a 0 here. Plugging the top number in, I get 10 minus 125 halves minus 125 thirds. In order to combine those together, I need a common denominator. No decimals anywhere other than that one problem, okay? So common denominator here would be 6. This one here, I'd have to multiply the top and bottom by 6. This one here, I'd have to multiply the top and bottom by 3. And this one here, I'd have to multiply the top and bottom by 2. That gives me 60, well, actually, let's combine the first two together first. I mean, you can use your calculator to do that, too, but it's negative 315 minus 250 over 6, which is negative 565 over 6. Okay, and no decimals. Questions on that one? Next one, the acceleration function in meters per second squared and the initial velocity are given for a particle along a line. Find the velocity at a time of t, so that's one question, and the distance traveled during this given time from 0 to 6. Okay, so first we're given a of t is 2t plus 5. First thing I can do is take and find the velocity by doing the antiderivative. Antiderivative of 2t is just t squared. It's 2t squared divided by 2, but the 2's cancel. Antiderivative of 5 is 5t, and then plus c. So this here is a formula for my velocity. But they gave me this piece of information right here so that I can find c. So... 7 equals 1 plus 5 plus C. This means 6. Subtract 6 from both sides. C is 1. So V of T equals T squared plus 5T plus 1. That is the first question. Find the velocity at a time of T. Okay, so that's that. Then it says find the distance traveled. The distance traveled uses an integral. But it does depend on if this here dips below the x-axis or not. Okay? Uh -huh. Not before zero. Not before zero, right. So your best bet is to try to figure out, like, what's happening with this right here. That right there, we know it's a parabola that opens up that crosses the y-axis at 1. Okay? That's what we can tell just looking at it. Can we come up with x-intercepts? It doesn't factor. Quadratic formula. X equals opposite of B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 times A times C. All divided by 2 times A. This is square root of 21 over 2. You have a calculator, right, that you're allowed to use. Let's find if any of those are between 0 and 6. So I have negative 5. Turn it on first. Negative 5 plus the square root of 21, I'm going to divide that answer by 2. It's crossing the x-axis at negative 1.79. And 
and negative 5 minus the square root of 21. Divide that by 2. Negative 4.79. So it's crossing the x-axis here and here, which means it's going like this. But what we're asking is to find the area between 0 and 6 over here. So if this is going up, it's asking me to find this. It's all completely above the x-axis, right? When it's all completely above the x-axis, that means I can just integrate from 0 to 6 that velocity. Because an integral means area under the curve. And of course, I need the time of 0 to 6. So this is t cubed over 3 plus 5t squared over 2 plus t evaluated from 0 to 6. Top minus bottom. Of course, the bottom number is 0. We love that. Plugging the 6 in, I get 72 plus 90 plus 6. Okay. Now I should label it. Meters. From a time of 0 to 6, this object has traveled 168 meters. So why did you find it missing first? Because if it would have done something like this, and here was 6, and here's 0, this area here would have been negative, and this area here would have been positive, in which case I would have had to, I'll call that, oh, it just died on me. Um, hold on, I gotta stop that video. So if it was like that, where part of it was above and part of it was below, let me just call this x right here, I'd have to say the integral from 0 to x of whatever the function is, plus the area from x to 6 of whatever the function is. But since this one is below the x-axis, it would come out negative. I would have to take the absolute value of it. So that's what total distance is. If it has a displacement, it doesn't matter. You just do the integral no matter whether it's above or below the x-axis. shouldn't matter at all. So that's why the x-intercept makes a major difference. Uh -huh. So for distance, you do the absolute mm -hmm. value for displacement or whatever? Right. right. And the only part you have to do the absolute value on is the part that's below the x-axis. So in this question up here, it was completely above the x-axis from 0 to 6. So we didn't have to worry about it. Okay. That's a really nice cake right there. There's enough other stuff going on in that problem. Okay. All right. Next one, number eight. It says approximate the area. Whenever area is mentioned in the question, it means if it is negative, you've got to change it to positive. Under the curve of y equals cosine x, so think of cosine x, it's this curve like this, from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, isn't that area negative? That means I have to put absolute value around my final answer, is what that means. Using four approximating rectangles of equal width and right endpoints. So I'm doing an R4 here, is what it's asking me to do means I need to come up with a chart. It's starting at pi over 2. I have to find my change in x. It's 3 pi over 2 minus pi over 2 divided by 4, since there's four rectangles here. When I subtract those, I get 2 pi over 2, which is just pi over 4. 
So my width of my rectangles is going to be pi over 4. That means I have to add pi over 4 to this until I get to 3 pi over 2. So isn't this the same as 2 pi over 4? So when I add pi over 4, I get 3 pi over 4. When I add pi over 4, I get 4 pi over 4, which is pi. When I add 4 pi over 4 plus pi over 4, that's 5 pi over 4. Add pi over 4 again, I get 6 pi over 4, which that reduces to the 3 pi over 2. Now from there, I have to plug it in to my function, cosine of x. So cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Cosine of 3 pi over 2, or 3 pi over 4 is negative rad 2 over 2. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Cosine of 5 pi over 4 is negative rad 2 over 2. And cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. R4 means the 4 to the right. So I have negative rad 2 over 2 minus 1, or sorry, plus negative 1. And then minus rad 2 over 2, and then plus 0. When I add those together, I get negative 2 rad 2 over 2, which is negative rad 2. And then minus 1. That's our 4, but because they mentioned that word, I have to put absolute values around it. You can either put it like this. You can have pi over 4 times rad 2 plus 1, you know, where you change the negatives to positives. Probably the most common. You could distribute the pi over 4 to both of them. Like, there's so many ways you can have your answer that are all correct. But. Questions on that one. Number nine, find the indefinite integral. This should probably be like the easiest thing that you've seen so far today. Um, that's just your um, add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. So you get 7x minus 5x to the fourth over 4, <laughs> bless you, plus 7x to the sixth over 6, and then don't forget, plus c. And then the last part, again, there is that word, area. You got to check and make sure that it's above the x-axis. Find the area of the region under the graph of f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 7 on the interval from negative 1 to 4. So I got to know about this graph. This graph is a parabola that opens up and crosses the y-axis up at 7. I know that. I need to know its x-intercepts. x equals <coughs> opposite of b, which is 3, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 9, Minus 4 times a times c, all divided by 2 times a. This is 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 19 over 2. Whenever you see the square root of a negative, what does that mean? There are no x-intercepts. That means this is a parabola that opens up, that crosses the... Um, uh, y axis right there, it might look like this, it might be over here, but whatever case, it's above the x axis, so I don't have to worry about any negative area. So when it's asking me from negative 1 to 4 to find that, it's always going to be above the x axis. So we have the integral from negative 1 to 4 of x squared minus 3x plus 7dx. I should see this. You should have this as your work. That's worth points. There were a few of you that I marked off homework points on because some of your worksheets that you turned in just, you had like numbers written down. You didn't have integrals and dx's. Like I can't give you calculus points if you don't have calculus stuff written down. Okay, so make sure that you have those. Then find the antiderivative. Add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. And then 
Unfortunately, this one does not have a zero there. So plugging the four in, I get 64 thirds minus 24 plus 28. And then plugging the negative one in, I get negative one third minus three halves minus seven. This would be 64 thirds plus one third when that distributes, which would be 65 thirds. These two give me plus four. This is plus three halves and plus seven. So from there, it looks like what? 65 thirds plus three halves plus 11. We could get a common denominator, which is six. Multiply this one by two, I get 130. Multiply this one by three, I get nine. Multiply this one by six, I get 66. So 130 plus 75 would be 205 over six. No decimals. Yes. So if it was a big cross x intercept, you would see absolute value for the part that was under. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it goes right back to that one that Marlo asked about with this right here. You do, you know, from here to here, it says it's below, you do the absolute value, and then from here to here would be the positive. Yep. Same kind of same kind of thing. But you gotta consider it, you know. You can't just take for granted that it's, you know, that it's all above. That, my friends, is for the next two days, okay? The first four tomorrow, and then five through 10 on Thursday, okay? No additional homework in here, just study, practice, that sort of thing.